Hello. Uh, for this week's session of 3CQFS, we have Navdeep Arya uh, joining us. Navdeep is a postdoctoral fellow from Stockholm University who recently joined Magdalena Zix group. They will be talking about uh, the unruh effect inside a cylindrical cavity. Take it away, Navdeep. Thank you, Evan. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, organizers, for the invite and today i'll talk about my work on unru effect inside a cylindrical cavity and different ideas uh, that will or may appear during this talk have been developed with uh, my collaborators uh, the outline of the talk is as follows i'll first in quickly introduce the unru effect and we'll note its strength we'll note that it is uh, usually very weak under traditional settings and then we pose our uh, main question for the talk that how the UNRU effect or the non-inertial effects in general can be uh, better resolved so to that end i'll uh, present three observations which i'll just call guiding ideas on how uh, we might be able to better resolve non-inertial effects in general and the UNRU effect in particular. I'll talk about modifying the density of field states using an electromagnetic cavity. And I'll also argue that there is some merit in being careful about which system property you, you decide to monitor in an experiment if you want to efficiently capture non-inertial effects in quantum systems. And then I'll also motivate why uh, it might be good to uh, to resort to the collective response of quantum systems to probe non-inertial effects and in particular uh, the UNRU effect. And then I'll talk about applying these three observations uh, in a concrete setup uh, for UNRU effect inside a cylindrical cavity. And in this setup, we'll talk about the decay rate and the lamp shift due to the UNRU effect and then we'll talk about the selective super radiant enhancement of the UNRU signal. And then I'll summarize the talk. Uh, so let us start by uh, introducing the UNRU effect and uh, noting its strength. The so UNRU effect is a theoretical prediction that states that a uniformly isolated observer registers the inertial vacuum state as a thermal state at a temperature uh, proportional to its acceleration. And uh, among other things, uh, it highlights the observer dependent nature of the number of particles in a, in a quantum state. And uh, I think it is all also very widely known that the UNRU effect is very weak under traditional settings. And so uh, in this talk, uh, I'll try to address the question of how to resolve the UNRU signal better. And whenever you see a bullet with a star uh, so this that 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 bullet is the is perhaps the most important uh, takeaway from that slide so uh, this is our question for today's talk which we'll try to address and so even before we do that even before we talk about better resolving the UNRU effect or uh, non inertial effects in general we will start by uh, by looking at how these effects uh, arise in quantum systems in first place. So if we consider a two-level atom interacting with a quantum field via this interaction Hamiltonian, which is linear both in the uh, atoms operators and the field operator, then Uh, give me a second. Yeah, then uh, it can be very easily seen that the physics of such an atom is governed by this function, which we will call the field spectral density. And so it is just the Fourier transform of the two point field correlator function. And you see that there we have the quantum field being evaluated along the trajectory of the atom. and from this expression, we note that this gamma nu, which governs the physics of such an atom, 
depends on atom state of motion because the two point field correlator uh, is being evaluated along the trajectory of the atom. So this means that uh, since uh, this gamma nu depends on the atom state of motion, this means that we can expect to see some corrections if you put the quantum system on a trajectory which has non-zero acceleration. And we also note that since we have this uh, quantum field here, and for example, if we write its expansion in terms of a, a complete set of modes, uh, we, we see that uh, the gamma nu will also depend on the density of field states, uh, uh, which for example, can be modified using an electromagnetic cavity. And the second observation that we want to make is that different properties of the atom may depend on, differently on gamma nu. So gamma nu governs the physics of such an atom with this interaction Hamiltonian and different properties of the atom may depend differently on gamma nu and further so which means that different properties may differ in their ability to capture non inertial effects and moreover uh, they may differ in the in the state of majority of the experimental techniques required to measure those system properties uh, for example yeah, yeah what's tau minus uh, tau minus is uh, just tau two minus tau one. Yeah. Uh, for example, I'll talk about uh, I'll mention two properties of an atom in this talk. One is lamp shift, and another is geometric phase. So by this this point here, what I mean is that uh, it. It, it might be possible that it is, it is easier to measure the lamp shift of the atom as compared to a geometric phase measurement of the atom. So we need to be aware of such uh, variations as well. So uh, now that we know how uh, non-inertial effects and the UNLU effect arise in quantum systems, let us have a look at how strong these effects uh, generally are. So if we talk about the UNRU effect, uh, transition rates, for example, get modified to uh, these expressions over here. Uh, gamma up arrow is the absorption rate and gamma down arrow is the emission rate of the atom. And so this term, for example, is the inertial contribution. So even if the atom is not accelerating, then uh, the spontaneous decay rate of the atom is uh, just given by here mu is the coupling constant and omega naught is the energy separation between the two levels of the two level atom we are considering and if we just run a simple uh, computation we can see that if you want to have this term which we just obtain by subtracting from the total uh, decay rate, the inertial contribution, which is just uh, captured by this one here. We note that if you, if you want this ratio to be of the order of one, you need a very large acceleration. Uh, the acceleration must, must be of the order of omega naught times c, the speed of light in vacuum. And it means that UNRU effect is in general very weak. And I'll be uh, very often referring to uh, the purely non-inertial signal or purely non-inertial contribution, which just means that you take the total non-inertial response of the atom, which for example, in the, on this slide, we have denoted by uh, gamma down arrow a, and with a subscript A for the acceleration and is given by this expression over here. So from this expression, if you subtract the inertial contribution, what you are left with is the contribution which is uh, entirely due to the acceleration of the atom. And we'll call such a uh, contribution as the purely non-inertial contribution. And so uh, one may considering consider lowering omega naught or C in order to lower the 
uh, acceleration requirement and in other works which we will not discuss in this uh, talk we have argued that if you want to lower omega naught without uh, diminishing the overall strength of the uh, the strength of the overall signal you better do it inside a cavity so, but we'll not talk about those uh, works today and there is a separate uh, line of investigation in which people have considered different analog systems where they try to replace C with the speed of sound, for example, or in general, try to lower C so that you then need a lower acceleration to see these effects. So this is our question and how the non-inertial effect can possibly be better resolved. And now I'll list the three observations that we think can be beneficial in, in our pursuit of uh, better resolving these effects. Uh, first one of these is uh, modifying the density of field states, and we do it specifically using an electromagnetic cavity. And let us see how, why that might be helpful. So again, there is this terminology alert. So I'll re repeatedly say, talk about tuning a cavity. So which would just mean that I am setting the normal normal frequency of the cavity uh, to some specific value. So it, what? So if I say tune the cavity to omega naught, I mean set the normal frequency of the cavity uh, equal to the equal to omega naught, which in our case is the separation between the two levels of the atom. And on the right, you have a just schematic sketch of a cavity. It has two mirrors and you place an atom between the mirrors. And it is known that if you do such a thing, uh, the quantum electrodynamical pr properties of an atom uh, would get modified. And it can also be seen from our expression of gamma nu, which uh, depended on the density of field states. And so now uh, two more observations which are directly relevant to us are that if you put an atom on an accelerated trajectory, then apart from responding at its proper frequency gap omega naught, it, it starts responding at some new frequencies as well, which are a function of the acceleration which we have given to the atom. And so <clears throat> this clear separation, we see only for the circular acceleration case, but it is true in general. So here, for example, I have made a schematic drawing to illustrate this point. So an inertial atom responds at the proper frequency gap omega no, but if you give this an atom, this atom an acceleration as well, then it will start responding at some shifted frequencies as well. So using a cavity, what you can do is uh, uh, you can either tune the cavity here or here. So what basically what you are doing is that you note that the inertial response feeds on this range of range of frequencies for the field modes, but the non-inertial response feeds on a different set of frequencies of the field. Then using a cavity, uh, you just have, you, you can have more number of field modes at a frequency surrounding a frequency that you want. For example, you can increase density of field modes uh, for the frequencies on which the purely non-inertial response of the atom feeds upon. And uh, another thing that we'll talk about today and a cavity can help is that you can design a cavity such that uh, its field mode structure is such that for all the field modes k the atoms proper frequency gap is lower than all the field frequencies so it would mean that an inertial atom will not respond under such a configuration because there are no modes to which uh, there are no modes which are in resonance with with the inertial atom but due to the doppler shift experienced by by an accelerated atom, 
such an atom would respond and we'll we'll see that you can use this uh, this feature or trick to even select the non inertial signal of interest and so i one more thing i'll repeatedly show you about is uh, this uh, the relative strength what, what i have been uh, what i'll call relative strength so the it is defined as the total total non inertial signal and from which you subtract the inertial signal and take the ratio of the resulting number with the total inertial signal and the idea here is that for example on your right you see a, a plot for experimental measurement of line width and lamp shift inside a cavity and the idea in using relative strength as a figure of merit uh, in combination with the acceleration requirement for some of the setups that i'll talk about is that we try to have a relative strength of the purely non inertial signal either greater than or at least of the order of the inertial signal for parameter regimes which in which for which the inertial signal has already been uh, investigated experimentally for example the in these plots such parameters would be how much you need to detune away from omega naught to see the non inertial signal and what is the quality factor of the cavity that you require or the volume of the cavity you require so we'll see if our requirement on these parameters are more or less the same as has been achieved in setups which were uh, dealing with inertial atoms and then for those parameter regimes we'll try to have the strength of uh, non inertial effects more or less or of the order of or large larger than the strength of uh, of the inertial signal uh, but of course we'll still be uh, need to aware of how challenging the requirements on parameters are because uh, the requirement of accelerating the atom might itself uh, uh, require us to consider some changed parameters and the second observation is that uh, we need to be aware of which system property we decide to measure in an experiment and this is the case because different system properties might depend differently on the spectral density of the field field modes for example transition rates are just uh, gamma nu evaluated at the proper frequency gap of the atom but lamp shift for example depends in a rather different way on gamma nu and lamp shift uh, is so you might already know it but uh, dirac's solution for the hydrogen atom levels predicted certain levels to be degenerate but later on those levels in experiments were found to be not degenerate and it was ultimately understood in terms of uh, the coupling of the electron cloud to the vacuum fluctuations which were not included in dirac's model of dirac's calculations so you we see that transition rates and lamp shift for example they de depend differently on gamma nu and we'll see how how much difference this can make later on another property that we have studied earlier and i'll talk about it in uh, in the context of today's talk as well late in a later slide is geometric phase uh, like the <clears throat> usual phase uh, which is known as a dynamical phase a quantum system when subjected to some evolution can acquire a geometric phase as well and as the name highlights it is a geometric property of the quantum system and it just depends on the geometry of the path that the quantum system takes in its hilbert space and it it also depends on a gamma nu in a yet another way 
uh, here t is the total time for which you allow the system to evolve and uh, the geometric phase being a phase of course uh, requires an atom interferometric setup for its detection so here i have a sch schematic diagram for uh, at least conceptually highlighting how such a measurement can be performed so you have a you have a beam of atoms which you currently split and you subject one of the arms of the interferometer to non-inertial motion and the other arm uh, propagates un unaltered. So the non-inertial motion will, uh, will lead to some relative phase between the two arms and which you should you might be able to measure it by uh, shifting the fringes. And uh, we studied geometric phase to detect uh, non-inertial motion, uh, non-inertial motion's effect uh, coming due to circular acceleration. And why did we did so was uh, one because uh, geometric phase is accumulative in nature. So it since these effects are weak, but it might be possible that you can acquire a small phase over a large time, and then you can possibly detect it. Another reason is that uh, it is a geometric property and it is invariant under the parameterizations of the path that the system uh, traverses in its Hilbert space. So, for example, a simple uh, time dilation effect would not change the geometric phase. And such things are important because the effect we want to probe is that the atom sees the field. Known trivially, which is the, I think, the essence of the Unruh effect that any effect must come from the fact that the atom sees the field in a non trivial fashion. So we want to remove as many, uh, as many contrib as many other contributions as we can, uh, which can come to the properties we decide to measure in an experiment. Uh, so we said that gamma nu controls the physics of an atom which is coupled uh, through the interaction hamiltonian that we wrote but if you, we have more than one atoms then instead of gamma nu gamma ij nu controls the physics in such a situation where it is the only change is that now the field operators are evaluated along the trajectories of two different atoms atom i and atom j uh, and since we are going to talk about uh, response of uh, collect uh, more than one quantum systems as well, it is important that we note that in such a situation, gamma is a controls the physics. Uh, for example, uh, gamma ij directly relates to the coherence among photons emitted by the atomic ensemble. So it is already known that if you have some emitter, then the coherence properties of this emitter are also mapped to the out, the emitted photons by this emitter. So, uh, for example, gamma ij nu then can tell you what would be the coherence among the photons emitted by such a quantum emitter. And also, gamma ij, for example, will uh, control casimir polder forces between two atoms. And the idea here is that you first study gamma i j nu and look for any inner any interesting uh, features arising due to non inertial motion or gravity, and then we, that would mean that such uh, interesting features will uh, manifest themselves in uh, some system properties as well, and then you set up experiments accordingly. Uh, the third observation is, uh, as I alluded to, is uh, probing these effects through collective response of quantum systems. We have already noted that uh, non-inertial effects in general on individual quantum systems are usually very weak, but we might be able to enhance or resolve them better using more than one currently interacting or correlated quantum systems. And in the upcoming slides, I'll talk about such a possibility uh, with the UNRU signal.
So, are there any questions at this point? Maybe I quickly. Okay, if not. Yeah, yeah. maybe I quickly go back to um, the geometric phase because I'm still not sure um, why this definition. I mean, if we take any phase and that is measurable in quantum mechanics, it's a number. Mm. So it is invariant, always invariant under any reparameterization. It's a it's a number, so it doesn't depend on the units or or your reference frame. So any any relative phase measured in the in the interferometer is invariant. Of course, if you change boost reference frames, then maybe you will divide differently. You will assign different omega when you have time dilation or different t, but the phase always would be invariant. So. Um, not sure what uh, what is that makes it geometric because in the standard definition it's when you change parameters of the Hamiltonian in such a way that you adiabatically change eigenstates and if you start in the eigenstates that it adiabatically follows the Hamiltonian and then at the end goes back to the same initial state but may acquire a phase that is measurable. So I wonder whether this is just a semantic difference or whether there is some aspect of this uh, parametric uh, change of the Hamiltonian that is somehow um, relevant here. How should we? Yeah, uh, uh, what I think uh, the initial understanding that you require adiabatic process changes and then uh, you would need to come back to the same, same, uh, same parameter same parameters was then extended later on by first by Mukunda and Simon and then by Tom, which showed us that geometric phase is in fact a kinematic uh, kinematic effect. So if you take the states of the atom uh, elements of the Hilbert space and you construct a quantity which is uh, geometric in the sense that it is in, uh, invariant under the parameterization of the path taken by the atom, then you automatically end up with what people have been calling uh, the geometric phase till now. For example, dynamical phase uh, depends sensitively on how fast the path has been traversed, but this is not the case with uh, geometric phase. So I think the difference between the two is uh, that the geometric phase is rooted in this uh, in this geometric property of the Hilbert space itself, uh, which specifically here just means that it, it is a quantity. Yeah, specifically under the parameterization of the path and not the whole uh, dynamical variables, because then it's uh, trivially yeah. uh, invariant. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think that. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. That, that's yeah. nice. It's, okay, yeah. cool. And Thank you. this aspect was dealt in more detail by my collaborator who wrote his thesis on geometric phase. So yeah, we can consult him as well if we we need to understand it in more detail. Now uh, I'll uh, I'll. I'll talk about him, uh, applying these observations to a concrete setup uh, for UNUR effect inside a cylindrical cavity. This is just a just an abbreviation for cylindrical cavity. Yes. And to already summarize the results, which that I'll talk about in this setup are. So if you just uh, introduce a cylindrical cavity and monitor decay rates, then you can achieve a relative strength for the purely non-inertial <coughs> signal uh, of one, which means that purely non-inertial contribution is of the same order of the inertial contribution. But if you, in addition to having a cavity, you also choose the system property that you decide to monitor judiciously, so to speak, for example, what we will argue that uh, it might be more beneficial to set up an experiment to monitor lamp shift. <coughs> Sorry. Then you can have the purely non inertial signal to be stronger than the inertial signal by even by a factor of 10 to the 3. 
and then at the end uh, then the third thing i'll talk about is having the cavity and the collective response of atoms in a same in the same setup and you monitor super ready and decay rate super ready and decay rate of the of the atoms and in such a situation i'll argue that you can achieve selective super ready and enhancement of the atom selective just means that you will no longer need to worry about the inertial contribution in such a setup so to motivate the cylindrical setup we are cylindrical cavity we are uh, considering i'll now highlight the building blocks of the onrow effect and then i'll argue that they lead us to the setup we we are considering so when we uh, uh, traditionally do the computation for the onrow effect we start with uh, the symmetry of the inertial space time under lorentz bose we identify the killing field uh, which generates this symmetry and then we compute the integral curves of k and we consider an observer which is moving along these integral curves then we set, set up the coordinate system which is adapted to this observer and we end up with the rindler coordinates and we then quantize the field in these new coordinates and we deduce a relationship between the inertial vacuum state and the field states in the new quantization and then we ultimately end up by with concluding that the minkowski or the inertial vacuum restricted to either of the rindler wedges is a thermal state at a temperature proportional to the acceleration of the observer and the second requirement which goes into such a computation is that you have full cosy hypersurface in the time and the space dimension along which you are considering the lorentz bose and uh, this condition was uh, relaxed and studied uh, in this paper where a mirror was introduced uh, at g equals 0 and it was shown that the tran transition rates of the atom can still show a thermal character but there might be other properties of the atom which will be able to distinguish between the two situations where you have the full cosy hypersurface uh, and the other situation where you do not have the full cosy hypersurface so we will not go into such in this domain we will stay on the path of standard ordinary effect and guided by these observations we consider the following setup so the point i am trying to make is that you need to leave the lorentz bose symmetry of the inertial space time untouched along a, along one one space dimension and then uh i want to say that you can uh, play around with the two remaining uh, spatial dimensions so that's why we are considering a cylindrical cavity which is open at both of its ends and we consider an atom oscillating along the axis of the cavity and the length of the cavity is assumed to be much larger than this length scale associated with Uh, the with the atom, the radius of the cavity is r. Um, is it important that the cavity be finite? Sorry, do you just treat, is it important that the finite that the cavity the finite length, or do you just treat it as infinite by saying that l is much larger than c divided by omega zero? Uh, in our calculations, the cavity cavity's length is not finite; it's infinite. But uh, all of the uh, can the conclusions and numbers we will go through if you just consider a large enough uh, long enough cavity uh, in the sense of uh, uh, in the in this sense where the length is much larger than the length scale associated with the atom and then in this setup in it can be uh, it it has been checked that the detailed balance condition is satisfied and also the cavity inertial vacuum restricted to either of the rindler wedges is a thermal state and it is already it has already been shown that either of these uh, two conditions 
is sufficient to ensure that the atom thermalizes uh, in the long interaction limit. So the point I'm trying to make is that this setup uh, probes the standard on row effect uh, by the defined the way we defined it earlier. And so once we have introduced the cavity, let us all also have a look at the field mode structure after we have introduced the cavity. So the inertial mode structure inside the cavity is uh, there are longitudinal field modes, which will denote by kg, and there are transverse field modes, uh, uh, which has uh, frequency chi m n over r. Uh, C has been set equal to 1. Uh, here chi m n is the n net zero of the Bessel j m. So it comes due to the imposition. Uh, the Bessel j zeros enter the analysis due to our imposition of this vanishing Dirichlet boundary condition on the field at the cavity walls. And the inertial modes uh, satisfy this dispersion relation. And uh, also, let us also know, note that the lowest transverse mode supported by this cavity, uh, the frequency of this mode is given by chi 0, 1 over r. <laughs> and so since the cavity is modifying the transverse field modes, so whenever the proper frequency gap between the two levels of the atom is equal to any of the transverse field mode frequencies, we'll call such configurations as the uh, resonance points of the atom cavity system. So <clears throat> now uh, let us see how the response of a ringler atom inside the cylindrical cavity looks like. Uh, we can compute it directly, but I'll here motivate it uh, in parallel with what we already know from free space. So in free space, the decay rate gets modified by this, uh, this additional term due to the uniform acceleration of the atom, uh, which you can also write like this. Uh, and then uh, using this integral identity, I can cast this expression in this form. So <clears throat> now we have written the expression in terms of an integral over the transverse field modes, which we are uh, modifying using a cylindrical cavity. And we already saw that K per the transverse field modes get replaced by these new field mode, for field mode frequencies for the transverse modes. And then, uh, I hope it is not hard to uh, accept this as the expression for the response of a Rindler atom inside this cylindrical cavity. Basically, you see that uh, the continuous modes have been replaced by discrete sums and by discrete transverse modes in these expression. And additional appearance of Bessel J functions are due to the fact that this expression uh, has been is in cylindrical coordinates, which are, of course, dictated by the cylindrical symmetry of the problem. And in addition, you have the cavity radius as well entering here. So now that we have the expression, yeah, yes. So I was going to ask, is there an obvious way to understand why this expression doesn't depend on Kz? Uh, the integral on kg has already been performed in this uh, to obtain this Bessel k function. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yes, yeah. And yes, uh, so now we can, uh, now that we have the expression for the response or the decay rate of a Rindler atom inside the cylindrical cavity, we can, we'll analyze this uh, expression using some plots. First, uh, let us do it for decay rate as well, since we wrote the expression for decay rate. <coughs> uh, if you plot, so total non inertial uh, decay rate is the one, the expression that we just wrote. And the in the same setup inside the cylindrical cavity, we, you can also write the expression for the inertial, the decay rate of an inertial atom, which 
looks like the curve given by the orange curve here and the blue curve is the total non inertial response of the atom which we just saw uh, in the previous slide the feature of to which i want to draw your attention here is uh, is these two points a and b so there are certain ranges uh, in which the acceleration of the atom contributes positively to the decay of the atom so there is some inertial decay rate for example for at this point uh, sorry along the x axis we are we have epsilon here which is just capturing by how much amount you are away from the first cavity atom resonance point so you see that there is there are these points at which you have some inertial contribution to the decay rate of the atom and then due to acceleration of the atom the atom decays faster this is the total decay rate but there are certain other configurations as well in which the cavity and the doppler shift experienced by the atom uh, makes it decay at a much lower rate even as compared to an inertial atom which we, we will call about these uh, regimes later but right now we want you to focus on this these two points a and b here uh, the idea here is that if you consider this difference between these the heights of these two points a and b you see that uh, there is this much purely non inertial contribution this contribution is coming only due to the acceleration of the atom and you and we also note that if you design your cavity such that you specify its radius in this range so for which all which means that there there is a range of epsilon values if you design your cavity in this range then you can have the purely non inertial contribution to the decay rate of the atom to be of the same order as the inertial contribution to the decay rate and <clears throat> the key lesson that is learned in this uh, by doing so is that the requirement of large acceleration can be traded for precision in cavity design so if you can design a cavity to a certain precision if you can specify its uh, radius to a certain precision then uh, you can correspondingly have stronger non inertial effects at smaller acceleration's uh, but it is also important to know that at max you can have the strength of the no purely non inertial effects of the order of the inertial effect itself so this uh, calli calligraphic e the relative strength that we have defined uh, at max will be of the order of 1 now i'll argue that you can uh, do much better than this by instead uh, studying lamb shift due to the unknown effect inside the cylindrical cavity Uh, the idea behind monitoring lamb shift to detect uh, unruh effect the motivation uh, there are at, at least two uh, facts that motivate us to do so the first one is that uh, due to sustained uh, experimental activity around uh, atomic spectroscopy we have with us available very high precision measurements of spectral lines for example on top you see the number you see is the experimentally determined transition frequency of the 1s to s transition uh, in electronic hydrogen atom and the second reason is that uh, using by monitoring the lamp shift or by studying the lamp shift you can reap much stronger non inertial signal uh, as compared to the case when you monitor transition rates and this this is because the lamp shift uh depends on gamma nu the field spectral density in a different way so now i'll plot gamma nu versus nu where nu is just different field frequencies for given values of r and omega naught and 
what we see is this. So this is the plot for the field spectral density as a function of field frequencies for given values of the cavity radius and for a given atom. So for from this plot, we see that uh, there is a range of field frequencies, for example, delta nu here and here. So there is a range of field frequencies at which the known inertial spectral spectral density of the field dominates the inertial spectral density. So, and due to the way lamp shift depends on gamma nu, you see that basically the lamp shift will capture all these ranges through the integral, integral over the field, field frequencies. You see that um, by studying lamp shift, you can take much more advantage of this fact that we noted with uh, transition rates that there are certain configurations at which uh, the purely non-inertial contribution can be of the order of the inertial one. But in the non-inertial, uh, in the lamp shift case, you can even kind of accumulate this enhancement over many field frequencies. And um, could, you, <coughs> could you show me yeah. equation for gamma mu? Yeah. Uh, where does omega zero come into? Uh, oh, omega zero is here. So what are you plotting on the next plot? On the next slide. I'm plotting gamma nu as a function of nu. So if we go back to Omega one, note is fixed here, yeah. But if we go back to the slide here, um, you're not plotting delta. So where is omega nu? Uh, omega, sorry, where is omega zero in the definition of gamma? Or where, where does it come in? Sorry, I didn't understand your question. So gamma of nu is meant to be the spectral response of the yeah, field. Yes. Yes. Um, so that depends on R because if you change R, that changes the density of field states. Yeah. So that'll change gamma. Yes. But omega zero, that's the energy gap of the detector, isn't it? Yeah, that's the energy separation between the two levels of the atom. Right. So is there a typo on the previous equation or does omega naught not dependent? So uh, are you saying that here I should have omega naught or something? I'm not sure. I'm just confused. No, uh, I, actually there is no typo in equation two. Uh, okay. Yeah, the lamb shift actually depends on gamma nu this way. So you can understand of the lamb shift as a process which complements the transition rate processes. So transitions between different atomic levels are mediated by, so to speak, real photons, which these are processes which involve absorption or emission of real photons. And the lamb shift is mediated by, pro is due to processes which are mediated by virtual photons. So uh, these photons need not be in resonance with the atom. So that's basically the idea behind calling them virtual photons. So the field uh, frequency so, which is at so resonance next, with the atom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the next slide you're plotting, this is the plot of lamp Gamma. Shift. No, no, lamp shift is here in, the, in this slide, yeah. This is just gamma nu. I am trying to motivate why uh, lamp shift might be able to capture uh, the non inertial effects more, more efficiently as compared to transition rates. So I am just plotting gamma nu here. Okay. No. Keep going. No, thanks. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and so on this uh, slide, I have the lamp shift. Uh, in the Rindler atom as a function of R omega naught, which we are calling the cavity due tuning parameter, which is basically, which just means that omega naught remains fixed and you are changing the radius of the cavity. And 
uh, epsilon captures how far away you are from the first atom cavity resonance point. So this is how the lamp shift inside the cylindrical cavity looks like for an inertial atom where these black dots are the different atom cavity resonance points. And these three plots are for a non-inertial atom. And here I am plotting the total lamp shift in a, in a Rindler atom from which I subtract the inertial contribution and take its ratio with the inertial lamp shift. And for example, we can have a look at this plot. Uh, and alpha is this dimensionless ratio, omega naught c over the isolation that you give to the atom. And alpha 10 to the 9 in this case, in fact, corresponds to acceleration 10 to the 9 meter per second square for, uh, I think this number is for a Rydberg atom. So here you can see that again, there is a range of epsilon. So you again have some freedom in uh, specifying the cavity radius. And if you do so, you can even have this ratio of the order of 10 to the three due to, uh, according to my understanding, this is due to the, uh, due to the plot just we saw about gamma nu and how the lamp shift depends on gamma nu. So to summarize the results, uh, here we are saying that if you take Rydberg energy levels, uh, purely non-inertial radiative shift, which is uh, stronger than the inertial energy shift by 10 to the two or 10 to the three can be obtained at although this acceleration is still large, but relatively small as compared to what earlier setups required, for example, 10 to the 17. If in addition, you can specify the cavity radius to a precision of 10 to minus seven. And so if you can't arrange for such, such a precision, then, and if you talk about lower precisions in the cavity design, then you, correspondingly lower the strength of the purely non-inertial signal you can harness from such a setup and you need to give higher acceleration. So this is a table which just lists uh, other possibilities as well. <clears throat> so uh, to motivate the requirement of this uh, precision in cavity design, we we refer to a two decades old experiment uh, for the reason that you can consider it to be an adaptable precedent in the sense that I mentioned in earlier slide, in one of the earlier slides as well. So this setup that they implemented differs from our setup only that in the only aspect that we require to isolate the atom. So what they did was they measured the radiative shift of Riddler energy levels, Rydberg energy levels in an inertial atom between two parallel metal plates. And in this setup, they were able to specify the spacing between the two plates uh, to a precision of 10 to the minus three using interferometric uh, setting uh, uh, techniques. So the idea is that such experiments can be adapted to linearly acylated atoms uh, at these much lower acylations, which still can be very challenging to achieve in a real experiment. So I also quickly want to mention some other possibilities uh, which has been which have been enabled by the UNRU effect inside a cylindrical cavity. So I refer to these points uh, at which the Doppler shift experienced by the Rindler atom plus the cavity mode structure, they interplay in such a way that the Rindler atom decays much slower than 
an inertial atom would have done in the same configuration. Uh, and it, in fact, that these at these points, the decay rate, at as well as the absorption rate of the atom goes to zero. And so it is like, uh, it enables the possibility of storing quantum information in a, such a cavity where you take advantage from the Doppler shift and the cavity design. And if you change the cavity radius, you can retrieve the stored information much faster than you would have done through the inertial mechanisms. But for this to be possible, you need to isolate the atom, which might not be so prudent. So there is another possibility. So people have studied analog systems to detect uh, equivalence of UNRU effect. If one of such proposals showed that if you consider an ion trap and you modulate the frequency of this ion trap exponentially in this fashion, then there is an there is there is an effective temperature associated with this situation, which depends on this modulation coefficient, the the the, the parameter that governs the governs your exponential modulation of the trap frequency. And such setups required kappa to be of the order kilohertz or megahertz but with the numbers which are possible uh, in the unru effect inside the cylindrical cavity the required kappa would be of the order of uh, tens of hertz but uh, for this to happen uh, we need to show that in the ion trap setups using the transverse confinement confining potentials you can mimic the role played by the role that cavity played in the owner effect inside the cylindrical cavity. If that can be done, if it can be shown, then uh, I think it, it might be very easy to see the, the equivalent of owner effect inside the cylindrical cavity in an iron trap setup. And in addition, uh, at least in, in theory, it also means that uh, you can maybe reasonably talk about a uh, relativity inspired quantum memory which takes advantage of uh, doppler shift and uh, the more structure inside the cavity so now uh, i'll briefly also talk about selective super radiant enhancement of the UNRU signal so till now we talked about we focused on this region on this region of in epsilon uh, we can also exploit this other region which is the region in which the proper frequency gap between the two levels of the atom is uh, less than all the field frequencies so remember that the inertial dispersion relation satisfied in the cavity is this so if you the frequency gap is even smaller than the lowest transverse field frequency allowed then you see that for all the field modes omega naught is smaller than the all the field modes in such a case of course the inertial atom would not respond so its response vanishes but due to the doppler shift experienced by the by the rindler atom the isolated atom it will still respond in this regime so if you you have your atom cavity in in a in a configuration which correspond to correspond to this regime you have basically selected the non inertial signal because uh, you have totally eliminated the second the most important competing signal in such setups which is the uh, inertial signal and uh, this happens due to the time dependent doppler shift experienced by the rindler atom and so once you select the uh, UNRU signal, you can, I think it a, an interferometric setup as well can be very promising to detect the UNRU effect because there you can also deal with the MP, ambient laboratory temperatures because any effects common to both arms of the interferometer are expected to cancel out. But already uh, we have been working on. Sorry, could you repeat uh, that last the, sentence? 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I was trying to argue that in all of these setups where you will try to uh, detect download signal, you will also be compete, competing against the effects due to ambient laboratory temperature, right? I missed that word, ambient. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So in an atom interferometric test, if the gradient in the laboratory temperature is not very steep, then you can expect that the ambient temperature effects would uh, cancel out between the two arms of the interferometer in the sense that relative phase would be introduced only due to the acceleration of the one of the arms of the interferometer. Uh, but already we have been working on uh, amplifying this selected UNRU signal using super radiance, which will which I'll briefly mention here. So super radiance to quickly cap recap is a phenomena where a collection of atoms interacting coherently with electromagnetic field radiates much faster and much stronger in the sense that the maxima of the intensity scales as the second power of the number of atoms n. And this decay has a well-defined direction as well, depending on what uh, geometry of the of the sample you are considering. And on top of that, I as I mentioned earlier as well, so any correlations which develop among these atoms which behave in a super radiant manner is also mapped to the photons which are emitted from these atoms. So and these such correlations such coherency has recently been measured so there are the decay is faster stronger it is directional and it the coherence among the atoms which lead to all those things is mapped to the output photons coming from these atoms so there are uh, plenty of observables which which might be useful in such a scenario that's what i'm trying to say uh, and in summary, it the super radiance captures all three three uh, features which are dear to an experimentalist. It has amplification precision due to the line width being uh, decreased by a factor of one over n, and sensitivity sensitivity of the it of what is known as the super radiant delay time. So you see that a single atom decays through this exponential profile and the maxima of the decay happens uh, decay rate happens at t is equal to zero but for a super radiant sample the maxima in the decay is delayed by a time known as the super radiant delay time and this delay time depends very sensitively on the quantum field fluctuations during the initial phase of the super radiance. Uh, that's where the sensitivity comes from. Although it is not always a good good feature, but we'll not go into the details right now. So for example, you can consider a setup like this. Uh, consider a lot of atoms arranged in an array or on a ring. And I'm showing just two of them here, and you accelerate this uh, this ensemble along the cavity axis. And what we have been able to show is that indeed these atoms would show super radiance. That is the maximum of the the intensity. The maximum intensity would scale as the second power of number of atoms. And remember that you can already have the atom and the cavity configuration such that you have already selected the UNRU signal. So that's why we are calling it selective super radiant enhancement. So once you select the UNRU signal, you might be worried that in such a regime, the signal would be very weak. But what we are arguing is that then you can supplement this selection uh, through a super, super radiant enhancement of the signal. Uh, there is another configuration possible for the atoms you arrange inside a cavity, which also brings in the more conceptual challenges. For example, UNRU effect in extended systems. 
uh, which has been shown in 2020 that UNRU effect is not only for single single quantum systems, yeah, it survives in extended quantum systems as well. So right now we are studying this setup, but equivalently or with some more additional features due to extra time dilation, such a setup can also be considered. And in this setup, we already know that even if you do not go to the selective regime of the cavity atom system that we mentioned, you can arrange the separation between two atoms inside the cavity such that all the coherence among the emitted photons, uh, which I just referred to, would be just due to the UNRO effect. Uh, to summarize, we talked about the UNRU effect and that it, it is weak. We discussed uh, how the UNRU effect or non-inertial effects in general can possibly be resolved better. We also uh, mentioned some new possibilities enabled by this phenomenon of UNRU effect inside the cylindrical cavity. And we also briefly discussed uh, the possibility of selective super radiant enhancement of the UNRU signal. Thank you. Thank you, that was a great talk. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you for, for the talk. Uh, do we have any questions for that? Um, I have a quick one um, yeah. about the, the last part, the acceleration. So this is just uh, out of curiosity because uh, we know from uh, kind of classic uh, paradox examples that uh, there is a difference uh, physical difference between scenarios where you accelerate, say, simultaneously and equally uh, some rigid object um, as, uh, and this simultaneously and rigidly is defined from the point of view of the inertial observer or from the point of view of the object. So I was wondering whether this distinction makes any difference in these scenarios. This is really just out of curiosity because it's a yeah, interesting yes. example. You have the array that needs to be accelerated. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you... Yeah, so actually that's what I meant by, uh, I think I said more conceptual, at least those were surprises for us when we started studying this setup because we were not initially hoping that this setup would be, behave as an extended system in the sense of uh, which was addressed in this 2020 paper. But due to the coherences, this in fact behaves as an extended system and moreover there is this issue of defining the rigid frame so if you want to keep the separation between the different atoms fixed then you need to consider that the different atoms have a slightly different acceleration relative to each other so this effect then leads to more time uh, the time dilation or uh, decoherence effects in the setup for example at one point, we were also trying to see the parallel of the effect that will, decoherence effect that we'll see here. And in your paper in which you introduce universal decoherence due to time dilation, whether there is some relation between these two phenomena here. So yeah, yes, these, uh, the ideas you refer to are important in, in this setup, uh, whereas this setup is much simpler here, where we, where none of these, things arise and you can simply, in a simple way, talk about selective super radiant enhancement. But in this setup, you have more kind of moving parts you need to be careful about. Uh, one of the most uh, surprising things I learned uh, it, when working on this setup was that if you are in a gravitational field, then an extended object even though it is in thermal equilibrium, due to the presence of the gravitational field, the temperature along the object need not be constant. So I think it is known as Tolman temperature or something. So yeah, this is still under development, but yeah, it has some surprising features. Awesome. Yeah, if you derive it I... by studying the system, then this is a really uh, great sign that uh, things are included. Uh, yeah. It's... Sure. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry for my throat. I really do not understand what is happening here in Stockholm uh, to my throat. But 
I'll figure out, I think, in a few weeks' time. Yeah, is there any other question? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, all right. Um, so, when you showed us your plot of, um, oh, I don't know how to describe it, where you know, your, your detector decay rate is zero because it's below the frequency threshold, this. This point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This so um, this you haven't used uh, single motor box, not single. So you haven't used the rotating wave approximation. There have you? You're just assuming uh, basically long interaction times. So is that why you don't get uh, a decay if the mode doesn't exist? That's a very way, poor way of describing it. Yeah, well, yeah, what, yes. Did take, yeah, what yeah. assumptions did you take get to make this plot in the the yellow plot? Sorry, what? Uh, what assumptions can you repeat you, the question? Yeah, what assumptions did you take to get the yellow plot on this graph? Yeah, uh, the assumptions are same for both the both the plots. Uh, in particular, the we are not considering any we are not allowing any finite time interaction. So in our case, in our calculations, interactions are infinite time only. Okay. And we are also using the rotating wave approximate, the standard quantum optical optical things we are we are doing here. All the approximation. Like by all I mean I think just the two only these the rotating wave approximation. At the dipole approximation as well when you write the interaction Hamiltonian. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I I think the I think the rotating wave approximation would be okay, given that you're considering infinite time. Um, but I, so uh, now my issue is with the um, with the, the the your interferometer proposal, basically the idea of your interferometer, which is, as far as I understand it, basically you want to create a system, at least theoretically, where you measure the geometric phase. So that would require finite time interactions. Um, basically. Yes. So in that, when that happens, this this yellow line won't be zero when epsilon is negative. It may be slightly yeah. uh, non-zero, and then um, yes, I suppose that would make your um, that epsilon measure that that not epsilon the uh, the curly e you have yeah. it might make it smaller. So the final time effects might make yeah. it a bit harder to detect this lunar effect. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that is actually a very interesting point. Yeah, yes, thank you for pointing this out. Yeah, I agree that finite time response would not vanish for the orange curve in such a clean way. Yes. And uh, also, the next question would be um, basically, it's more of a question about the super radius plot you had on. 525, I guess, must have been. Um, I think this the caption says it's from a different paper, but uh, if you have sort of this super radiance set up in your cylindrical cavity yeah. and you have epsilon yes. negative, then yes, that exponential decay that would be zero, basically, wouldn't it? or it wouldn't decay at all because uh, should, shouldn't your non so in your inertial system, mm -hmm. not decay at all in that situation. So that, that would mean basically that, I guess what I'm trying to say is, in your super radiant setup, yes. the, if you have selective super radiance, then your, mm -hmm. when you, if you plot that, basically that same plot you had there in page 25, you should have, you know, you keep adding atoms and the inertial system should have no decay at all and you just keep enhancing the signal of your super radiance. So I guess that's even better in that situation. Yeah, roughly this is the idea. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, well, this is my question. What I really like though is uh, the, the memory the result of your, your result from quantum memory or the idea of using this as a, a way of yeah, yes. experiences. Um, 
I just think from an experimental point of view, uh, yeah. I would trust, I would sort of look, if, if you give me this uh, setup, I think you'd get a better signal for Uno effect looking at point B rather than point A, because your, assess, your experiment will always be noisy. So point A might be a bit closer to the inertial line. But if you get any signal below the inertial line, yeah. Then you yes. say, oh, you know, even with all the noise you experiment with us, we got something good. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 I agree. Okay. Uh, uh, you have an idea. We, I've been thinking how to, how do I do, what I do to the transverse confining potentials in a conventional iron trap to mimic the role played by a cylindrical cavity. So actually, I don't know till now how it, it will be done. I have spent some time uh, going through the literature, but in case you have any ideas or suggestions. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, that's, those are my questions. But thank you very much for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and comment. Comments. Yeah. Excellent. I have uh, one question. Uh, yes, myself. please. Um, you brought up a table on the precision requirements for some of these parameters. They, um, yeah. We're, we're quite high, I think. Um, is there a way to lower those requirements? Would super radiance help with, um, with this? Uh, I think super radiance will, the, the setup that uh, aims to use super radiance will slightly lower the requirement like by one order of magnitude at max, the requirement on this cavity radius specification. And so now since you have a stronger signal, you we also expect to lower the requirement acceleration also slightly, but this might not always be a good idea because you will always be competing against the ambient temperature effects inside a cavity in, in, this, in this setup. So, even in principle, in the calculations, even if you can lower the requirement on isolation, uh, you also need to be aware that how how the resulting UNRU signal would compare against the ambient laboratory temperatures. Did I answer your question? So yeah, yes, I am saying that so using super radiance will allow us more freedom in terms of uh, isolation requirement and the uh, the requirement for cavity design, but I am also saying that you might not want to go, you might want, yeah. not want to use the full freedom that you receive in the acceleration requirement because then you might lose the UNRU signal, your UNRU signal might be swamped by the ambient temperature effects in the, in the laboratory. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Doesn't look like it. Uh, in that case, we should thank Navdeep again. Uh, thank you for giving your talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. And I received very interesting questions and comments which would certainly be of help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.